So unfortunately, this law orders states to do things. That's unheard of in our system of government. This law says states will set up insurance exchanges. States will use their resources, their funding, to do this and this and this. That's the basis of the Medicaid challenge. The states are losing all their ability to, to make policies based on what their own taxpayers can afford. Yes, ma'am. In doing some research on the internet, I found a word, demitude, which according to this research, it says this Obamacare will tax Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and Hindus for not being Muslim because this word on page 107 specifically taxes you if you're not Muslim. Right. I, 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 I've, I've received many questions about this. But um, I haven't been able to find this. You're welcome to come up and take a look. <laughs> I haven't been able to find this. I've received this question so many times, um, and I just have not been able to find now this in the law. Now, we're Is finding it. Our, what? Could it be in the House bill instead of the Senate bill? Well, of course, you mean in the House version? In the House bill. That's why I said the, the House yeah. bill. Yeah. Well, it could have been section. Well, it could have been in that HR 3200, the old one, that also had the end of life counseling. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Well, you can keep that. Yeah. I have yeah. You mean the death panel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, you know, when that Obamacare first came out, it was 36 million Americans that were not covered. Those were all the illegal aliens. Just so you know. Right. Well. We know that 12 million are illegal aliens. Um, they're exempted from any of these requirements. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the mandate and the uh, problem with the 10th Amendment uh, ordering states to do things. Are there any other salient constitutional problems? Oh, yes, and there are so many challenges coming down the road if we don't win this time. Let me just articulate a few of them, okay? First, uh, and I mentioned this before, Section 1311, which for the first time in history empowers the federal government to dictate how doctors treat privately insured patients. One of the things this law does is to give the federal government the power to standardize medical practice all across the U.S. Well, we know that that's unconstitutional because in Gonzales v. Oregon, 2006, the Bush administration tried to limit how doctors in one state, Oregon, use certain types of medications on certain patients. And the doctors of Oregon took the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court and won. And the decision stated that the Bush administration could not do this because it would signify a tremendous shift of authority from states to the federal government to impose standards of medical practice in every region of the country. And that, they said, far exceeds the powers of the federal government. So that will be one. A second will be challenges based on privacy, because this law creates a tell-all relationship with every doctor you see. Your, med your, your treatments are entered into this broad electronic database, so uh, you have a bout with depression and see a psychiatrist, your foot doctor is going to know about it, etc., etc. You could just fill in the blanks. Right? Thirdly, one more, thirdly, there are already religious groups. Uh, and by the way, there are several privacy challenges already filed, one with the Goldwater Institute, for example. Thirdly, religious groups are challenging the concept that the Secretary of Health and Human Services can impose mandates on what your health plan must include, even if it violates your First Amendment freedom to practice your religion. As you know, there's, that's already been very much in the news because of the Obama administration's efforts to compel employers of all sorts to provide contraceptive coverage. There's nothing in this law, by the way, that mandates contraceptive coverage. It's left entirely to the discretion of the executive branch. So even though Kathleen Sebelius and President Obama say all health plans must cover contraception, the next president can come in and say no health plans will cover contraception. It's, one of the things this law does is to vastly expand executive 
discretion, executive decision making at the expense of even the lawmaking branch. Ridiculous, right? Now you, sir, had a question. Yeah. How long does the law affect long term care? Well, um, there's not a lot about long term care in the law now. There was the Class Act, which was a uh, a Ponzi scheme to provide long term care insurance. It was never feasible. It was actually put into this law because in the first eight to ten years the revenues would be collected premiums and there would be no payout. So it made it look like uh, the whole law was paid for when in fact it wasn't. The class act, a small segment of this law. But what I mean is we're paying a lot of money now oh. and they're saying long term care is gonna double and triple which nobody can afford. Oh, right. But there is no other provision in this law for long-term care. Well, yes, you know, sir. You know, if I can. Yes. You won't really have to worry about long-term care. Right. In the back. Where, where's the leadership from the opposition? And I'll, I'll reference that in terms of, that's a 2,700-page bill pretty much ran through partisan, they had to put in all these little perks to get people right. to sign yeah. up to it. Corn husker kickbacks, right. etc. Why yeah. are we not seeing a 10 page bill from the Republicans that will address the sound bite issues like right. keeping uh, kids on till 26, about the ability to pre existing conditions, all these little things that are You are so smart. And you are so smart. And that's exactly what the Republicans should be doing. In fact, I have a 20 page bill in plain, honest English that does many of those things. And I've sent it to members of Congress because I would like to get them rolling ahead <coughs> with some positive counter arguments to this. And you hear the President and Mrs. Obama and so many others say, well, if we strike down this law, you're going to lose your ability to keep your kids on your plan until 26. Well, first of all, you won't because you could pass that in a half-page bill yeah. in mm -hmm. one afternoon. And I'm perfectly sympathetic. I know that my kids are going to be on my cell phone bill until I die, and then I'll have to provide them. <laughs> that problem in a half a page. But have you gotten any response from any of these congressmen? No, it's, it, I agree with you that it's unfortunate that so much of the rank and file Republicans in Congress, they're focused on the negative ads and et cetera too. And um, we, we just need we more. Need, we need true leadership. We That's need true leadership. You are so right. Yeah. In the back, sir. Uh, if the government screws up everything it touches, why should they be in health care in any way, form, shape, or anything? I agree. None of their business. I, I so agree. And, you know, I, I smile because I've heard members of the administration, the administration is spending a tremendous amount of money on marketing, marketing this law, even though two years after it's enacted, it's as unpopular as the day it was signed into law. But they're still churning out the marketing. And one of the things they do is they talk about these health insurance exchanges and how wonderful it's going to be. You're going to be able to pick from the, the bronze, the silver, the gold, or the platinum. It sounds like going to Tiffany's, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it isn't. All, those law, all those health plans are identical, except for the size of the copay. And going to a health insurance exchange is going to be just like going to the DMV. And that's why I'm mentioning it, sir, because we don't want to get our health care at the DMV or at the post office. Yeah. And common sense tells us that's what it's going to be like. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How um, is it Kagan who said that who helped with yeah. the health care? Yep. And then also with um, Ginsburg who doesn't believe in the Constitution. Oh yes. How can they be even on their voting for that? I so agree. They and Kagan will never with the Federalist Papers who said as much during her confirmation hearings. Yeah. Kagan should have know? recused herself. Yeah. She should have, but unfortunately the Supreme Court's only method of discipline is self-discipline, and she did not do the honorable thing. Yes, ma'am. One question. This has been thrown around so many times. Are our elected officials part of this? 
or do they have their own health care bills still? They and have they always had their own? They've always had their own, and, and they, will they continue, continue to have, to have their, their own. own. What's the the world? World. Well, I think I it should be a bill to do that. Yes, yeah, of course. Health. Don't they yes. have one that's more in the budget, though? Is it, is it the coverage of care? Yes. So it, there is a rebuttal to the yes. Obama care. That's right. I do think that the Paul Ryan budget offers a rebuttal to many aspects of this law, particularly to Medicare and Medicaid. But your point, sir, in the back was also very important, that if we offered a 20-page bill or a 10-page bill, as I mentioned before, that address some of the popular early features. Now, not all of these popular early features are quite as good as they sound, because after all, there is no real tooth fairy. You know, they tell you preventive care is now free. It's not free. You're forced, when you buy your health plan, to pay for all of it up front in the premium. So there's no copay or deductible when you go to get that colonoscopy, right? But it's not free. You've already been forced to pay for it. And let me tell you that being forced to pay for a colonoscopy feels almost as bad as getting one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's the preparation. Right. <laughs> exactly. Hi, yes, sir. Hi, Doc. Come on, I'm Matthew Malay. Nice to see you again. Thank nice you. to see you. Would you please uh, talk to us a little bit about, as individuals, how the Constitution empowers us to have courageous defiance against unconstitutional laws as individuals? Well, let's start with the First Amendment, yes, ma'am. right? Yeah. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we really need to do now more than ever before. In a way, our political system isn't really living up to its promise, because so many of the perfunctory go-along-to-get-along politicians, and we all know them, right. aren't standing up. They're not, they're not willing to really speak out in favor of our liberties. They like what they do, and they just want to get reelected. Mm -hmm. you know? And we have something higher at stake now than their reelection: our freedom, yes. our way of life. Yes. And we, so we have to be really bold about it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I see there's a lot of senior citizens here, and the AARP that most of them belong to, I'm sure. No. I hope <laughs> they <don't know. laughs> And AARP is pushing this Obamacare. Oh, yeah. You oh. should ask all your friends to drop the membership. Yeah. 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 Very big signal to the Obamacare. Do Obama not join the AARP. Oh, no. yeah. It's just a billion dollar insurance company that they don't. Yes. Yeah. yes. I have a question. And uh, I'm sure most of the people here have heard uh, there was a radio call in to Mark within a few months ago. Oh yes. Uh, about the uh, the brain surgeon. Brain surgeon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I recently received another similar piece of information about a doctor, Susan Allen, in Tennessee, emergency head of emergency services, and she talks about the ethics panels, quote, death panels, mm -hmm. that once you once you pass 75. <coughs> Any emergency care that they deem to be, eh, it might be too expensive, has to go before the panel, before it can be provided. This is from the head of emergency services, who indicated that, gee, a funny thing happens is that most of the time it's either in the evenings or on the weekends. Do we really believe the panel is going to be available? Right. Well, let me address this because this is one of the reasons that I've dropped everything in my life to work so hard against this law. Because it is so life threatening to seniors. And there are provisions, particular in the law itself, that I'll talk about, like the Independent Payment Advisory Board. This is a, uh, a board of 15 health czars and zarinas who will have the authority to determine how much the government will pay under Medicare for particular procedures. Now, the law says, well, IPAP doesn't have the power to actually deny a treatment or to eliminate a benefit, but those are weasel words, because they can reduce what the government pays a hospital to do a hip replacement or a knee replacement. They can push it down so low that no hospitals or doctors will provide those procedures anymore. That's and right. that is life-threatening to all of us. Uh, so IPAB, by the way, that will also be challenged constitutionally for over-delegation of congressional authority. Congress has always uh, done the budget making for Medicare, and this is a 
the radical departure from Medicare as we know it, to coin a phrase used by the Obama administration, this creation of this IPAP board. But in addition, there's something happening at many of the Ivy League medical schools and certainly at the uh, uh, medical institutions in Washington, D.C., the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the Institutes of Health. They call it bioethics, but really it's so unlike what we would consider ethical. It's not ethical. There is such an emphasis now on limiting care for the elderly. Logan is wrong. It's really yep. terrible. We already see it in England where they where they where the nice committee there's nothing nice about it, that's a very deceptive word, acronym. But the nice committee in the British National Health Service, they take the cost of the treatment and they divide it by the number of years the patient is likely to benefit. Well you can see the repercussions. Elderly people have a denominator problem. They're not going to benefit from any treatment for as many years as a 40-year-old. So they don't qualify. Now you hear all the time the president saying, we spend too much on the elderly. Give the grandma her pain pill instead yeah. of her hip replacement. Uh, you saw it on the cover of Newsweek, uh, pulling the plug on grandma. This is the decline of the moral values of our civilization. We cannot allow this to happen. And in addition, it's also based on two, two distortions of science, right? I'll give you an example. There was an article in Lancet, one of the premier medical journals, just a few months ago, that said that 32% of the elderly have surgery in the year before they die. How horrible, they said. We've got to limit access to surgeries for older people. Well, this was a complete, uh, it was like a shell game. It was just a, a bag of tricks, this study. Because if they looked at all the surgeries done, they would have found that many, many elderly people benefit just as much from surgery as younger people, particularly for, for cardiac surgery. There are several studies that show that it's not your age that matters, it's your stamina, your resilience. And that can be tested. There's a, a uh, Johns Hopkins did a, developed a very simple 15 minute test to assess which patients will survive surgery, resume their active lives, go home, and benefit from it, right? It shouldn't have anything to do with the birthday on your driver's license. And so it's very important that we stand up against this. The other myth is that doctors deliberately spend a lot on patients who are about to, to die. There's a study that was done at Emory University several years ago that proves that when doctors know a patient is about to slip through their fingers, they do cut back on what they spend. But so often doctors can't tell which patient is going to survive the year and benefit and go home again, and which one isn't. And we certainly don't want to deny care to people who have a capacity to benefit from medical care and enjoy years to come. So we have to speak out very loudly against this trend in the Ivy League halls of medicine and the great institutions in Washington to deny care to the elderly. The agenda, it couldn't be clearer. In this law, I'll tell you what page it's on because I was so shocked when I saw it. In this law, on one particular page, it empowers, oh yes. Yep, section 4105A. It empowers the Secretary of Health and Human Services to reduce preventive care benefits for seniors. And half a page later, it empowers the Secretary to increase preventive care services for Medicaid. And that's what this is. They are robbing grandma to spread the wealth. Yes. One more question and then I'm going to leave you. Go ahead. No, what I meant to ask you about Romney Care. Yes. Is Romney Care as bad as this? Well, it's different. It does have some of the same features. Individual mandate. Employer mandate. We didn't talk about that at all, but we should in a second. Uh, interference with how doctors treat patients. End of life program. 
there's one more. So Romney believed in all of this. Huh? That's, that's Let's talk about the employer mandate for a second. Because we didn't cover it, and it hasn't been covered well in the news, but it's really a serious business. Despite the employer mandate in this law, fewer people will be getting their health insurance on the job after this law is fully in effect than before. Is that amazing? Right. And of course, that's how most people under age 65 get their health insurance. 165 million people get health insurance through a job, either their own or their spouses, or maybe in some cases, a parent's. But the mandate is so specific and costly. It's not just you will provide health insurance for your workers and their families. Oh no. It specifies such a costly package that a large number of employers, according to McKinsey and Company, one of the premier management consultants, half of employers will literally drop coverage altogether and those people are going to find themselves in many cases in Medicaid against the world or shopping on the health insurance exchanges for their own their own uh, coverage because the employer is faced with two options. Well, they can provide that minimum wage worker with a $5,000 health plan that adds $1.79 per hour to the cost of hiring a minimum wage employee, right? Or they can pay a $2,000 a year fine and say, go get your health insurance through the state Medicaid program. What would you do as an employer? It's obvious. Yes, sir, this is the last question. Isn't, isn't also like a hidden agenda here is they're creating a black market for health care that only the affluent and rich can afford? Yeah. That could be, or a single payer system. Right. right. But, uh, why don't they just um, put competition in, like, uh, limit all these uh, uh, rules and regulations that they have on the That's the way you and I think. Yeah. But the people in Washington, have a Washington <coughs> the only bill that they should be putting, the only bill that they should be putting should be on the people of Washington and no one else. I agree with you. Thank you very much for having me.